so today's sermon, I hopefully, hopefully you can see that, is on um, biblical accountability. Right? So an interesting topic that I don't think that we've covered here for a while. Um, I titled it Discipleship 101 because to me, biblical accountability is the foundation of disciples. Um, it's the foundation of discipling one another after the foundation cornerstone of accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. So after that happens, the next step is to become a disciple and to disciple others. And biblical accountability is the foundational piece of that. Um, so uh, most of this sermon... It's going to be very quick, so I actually went online to see what other people were saying about this, and I borrowed most of this from a company called Covenant Eyes. Um, they design software for uh, promoting biblical accountability with online. Um, but the idea is, is that uh, you know, it's a short message. It's going to be 15 minutes or less, and although it's short, it's actually meant to provoke thought and hopefully action between one another that's going to last for the rest of our life. So this is a lifetime thing. So open up your heart, open up your ears, and hear what, uh, what this message has to say, or what God is saying to you through it. Um, so before we move forward, I do have two questions for you. The first question, just raise your hand. Who here is familiar with the term Biblical accountability, or or an accountability partner. Who's familiar with accountability partner? Okay, some of you, most of you have, some of you have not. Okay, now, who here has an accountability partner? Someone that you actually talked to and have purposed specifically to be an accountability partner for you. Okay. Few of you, much less. So we understand the term. We understand, most of us understand what an accountability partner is. Very few of us actually have one. All right. So that is uh, a good thing for us to be hearing this today then. Okay? Um, so the word accountability, if you pull up your Bible and you look for it, I don't think you're going to find it. Um, it's a term that is used uh, by many churches to encapsulate like a whole thought process around how we deal with relationships in the church. Right? Um, uh, if we're, so if we're going to disciple, right, discipleship one-on-one, if we're going to disciple others and we're actually going to be a disciple ourselves, we need to have a biblical vision for a discipleship community. And what is that disciple community supposed to look like? Um, we're going to just answer those questions by looking at three key Bible verses. And as we read each task, text, I want you to ask yourself, um, what would your life be like? How would it be different if you intentionally and regularly obeyed the scripture that we're covering? Okay? So if you applied it and you obeyed it, if you did that every day, what would your life be like? And how would it be different? All right. So, verse 1. Okay? So, verse 1 is based on mutual confession and energetic prayer. All right? So, James 5.16. So, it says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So, we're supposed to confess our sins to each other. You know, going off script here. <laughs> Jess says no. Don't do it. <laughs> going off script. The thing about the church, or the perception about the church, can be that if you confess your sins to someone, if they actually realize what you're going through, what the things you're putting your mind on, that people aren't going to accept you 
they're not going to help you through that process. What they're going to do is they're going to look at a constitution or bylaws and say, I now have a biblical foundation for kicking you out of the church. Right? Be gone. It's a dismissal. You know? But in all actuality, we all feel the same. Okay? So we need to get over the fear that we have about being expelled or not accepted. And we need to actually sit down and start genuinely confessing sins to one another. You know, there's, there's a level of intimacy there that we have to achieve in order to actually be a disciple and to disciple others, in my opinion. Um, so, this text that we read is the classic creed for accountability groups. Um, in the passage, James is urging his readers to regularly confess their faults to one another and pray for each other. The incentive that is offered is tremendous, that you may be healed. All right? If you're dealing with things that you're not healed through, this might be one of those things that you look at and say, am I applying this? Okay. All right, so our lives are filled with all sorts of ailments, troubles, hardships. We, are, uh, we all experience, we experience punctuated times in our lives. Um, that we are going through physical sickness, poverty, emotional trouble. It's at these times that James tells his readers to call for the elders of the church. Right? So the elders um, are supposed to help you through that process. And if personal sin is lurking beneath the surface, somehow contributing to the suffering, and as many times it really is, sin is contributing to, to it, um, then those sins are on earth. Explored, confessed, and forgiven. Okay? That's what that's what the purpose of the elders are. Now, this scripture, what this is saying is in light of the valuable ministry of the elders, James calls the church at large, so all of us, to practice a form of preventive spiritual medicine. Alright, so instead of merely waiting for the times when we hit rock bottom, we have or we are we are to have regular checkup checkups with each other. Like preventative checkups, all right. So we're supposed to have rich face-to-face -face relationships of confession and prayer together. All right. So what would happen if we lived this out? What would happen if you intentionally and repeatedly gathered with just a few other believers to confess sin and to pray for one another? All right. What would happen if you lived this way with your spouse, with your Christian friends, and your mentors? What would happen? So James had a vision when he wrote this of a community of mature believers who prayed prayers of great power. Right? And if we lived in this sort of confession prayer community, it's my belief that we would see more healings and we would have more health in our hearts and our bodies. Right? Um, verse 2. Right, so verse 2. We are to motivate others to radical love and hope. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 to 25 says this. So let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. What day are they talking about? They're talking about the day that Jesus returns. Okay. So, we are to persevere in our faith right up to the end of our lives. Okay. From beginning to end, you are to persevere. Um, we're supposed to hold on to the hope we have in Christ. Instead of shrinking back in our faith, we are called to move forward. God has called his people to display Christ-like tenderness and affection, to do good works that bless the world, and to long for the day when Christ will come and make the whole world new. Right? So relationships are a crucial part of persevering and our growth. These relationships um, have three basic commands given to us in these scriptures. Okay. One, we're to meet together. Two, we're to stir one another up. And three, we are to encourage one another. Right? 
So the word stir up there, it can be translated urge, spur on, motivate. It can also be translated as provoke, and it can even carry the meaning irritate. If I have to provoke and irritate you in order for you to live a more Christ-like life, I would do that for you. <laughs> and I would appreciate if someone would do that for me. Oh, don't worry, I will. Thank you, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the word encourage, that means to call someone to your side. Right? So in order to strengthen them with your words, there's other ways to encourage, but words are a big thing for encouragement and in relationships. So it can refer to a variety of encouraging speech, instruction, comforting, admonishing, warning, urging, begging, consoling. In the context of this verse, it refers to Christians coming together to strengthen each other with an eternal perspective, helping each other to set our hope fully on the coming day of Christ. How often do we talk about the coming day of Christ? Right? We talk about the death, we talk about the resurrection, and sometimes we do talk about his second coming. But the second coming, every day we're alive, every second we're alive, we're one step closer. Yeah. All right. So how many of us here can say that we regularly get together with our other brothers and sisters where we can think of creative ways to provoke one another to show radical love mm -hmm. and good deeds. All right. So you, how many of us can say that we regularly do that? How many of us regularly help one another set our sights on the coming kingdom of God? And what would change if we pursued these sorts of relationships? Verse 3, last line. All right, let's read it. So Hebrews 3.13 says, But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So again, we are to persevere and ensure one another each day of our lives. As long as it's called today, we have something to do today. Okay? The verse means that we are to dig beneath the surface of our accountability relationships. Right? So you need to find relationships. We need to find relationships where we can be held accountable to one another. And we need to go beyond just mere behavior and look at motivations. Okay, so there's motivations that keep you doing these things, you know, sin, right? So there's two types of accountability. Uh, one is behavior. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about that real quick. So behavioral accountability is choosing to be honest with another person or a group of people about our obvious habits or tendencies. Are we easily given it to lust in specific settings? Do we overspend or blow our budget? Are we lazy at our jobs? Do we gossip or slander someone's reputation? Do we lose our temper with our spouse or children? Are we addicted to anything? Is technology or work stealing attention from our families? Do we lack spiritual discipline? Do we neglect making opportunities to share our faith? Confessing these sorts of struggles is very important. It stops bad habits from festering into deeper issues, but it is only the beginning of helpful accountability. So if you're not asking those questions to one another, you need to, in my opinion, and that's the beginning of something, right? And then there's motivational accountability, and that's where we start really stripping down into layers, and that's, you know, choosing to be honest with one another person or group of people about the desires and thoughts that we tru that truly drive and motivate us, right? So this is about getting to the sin beneath the sin. So it may even be sin in which we are unconsciously aware. If you were to ask me today what sin I committed this week, I'd be hard-pressed to actually find it. You know, I, I've actually been thinking about it all morning during worship. I'm saying, thinking, what sin did I commit this week? And I can't think of one. And I'm not saying that I didn't. Jess, what sin did I commit this week? <laughs> 
So we you should have talked to me beforehand. I'm thinking we had a rough week. Okay. So I don't know if I can put a name on it, but yeah, we were bickery this week. Bakery. So is that a sin? I don't know. Sin we were bitey at each other. Bitey. Right. So, so there you go. Sin? This is the thing about accountability, right? It's easy for someone to see it. It's much easier for someone else to see it. Now, sometimes you may be going about your life thinking everything is just fine and dandy, and the person next to you is like, dude, your world is upside down, and you don't even know it. All right, so it requires really knowing one another and asking hard questions. Are we fascinated with Christ and the gospel? Are you? Am I? Do I find great joy in God? What do we desire more than anything else? Like, if you had your wish today, what would it be? Christopher sent me that text. Te sent me a text this week and said, you know, if you had one thing right now, what would it be? My response immediately, immortality. And he was like, no, no. He's like, not that type of question. If you had, like, a gift. I'm like, yeah, immortality. <laughs> but the idea is, is what, you know, what spurs you on? What do you desire more than anything else? Um, what do you find yourself daydreaming or fantasizing about? Do we covet anything? Do we think more about how we get to serve ourselves or how we can boast in Christ and serve others? Are we holding on to bitterness? Where do our thoughts drift to when we are when we enter social settings? Um, where do our thoughts take us when we're alone? What lies, what lies do we believe that continually drive us to disobey God? And do we love anything more than God? All right. Sin, sin now, it works at the deepest levels of our personality, our thought process, and our desires. Perhaps we don't experience deep and profound change because we neglect the sort of mutual exhortation that this text promotes us to do. So would our lives be different if we chose to live out these scriptures together? Mm-hmm. Would they? Absolutely. So here's the conclusion. Many Christians, including myself, oftentimes we see accountability as a crutch that we shouldn't need. Right? If I'm dealing with a sin, I'll think to myself, you know what, I don't really need to be accountable to someone. I am accountable to God. Okay? I need to confess my sin to him. I need to work this out. And he's going to help me through it, right? But what if accountability shown to us through scriptures is actually one of God's ordinary? It's not a crutch. What if it's one of the ordinary means that God has created to help us become more Christ-like? Okay? What if it's a crutch every one of us need. It's an ordinary means of becoming more Christ-like. All right? What if we were meant to treat accountability not as a last resort, but as a lifestyle? If you don't have an accountability partner, or if you have one, and you want to be more successful in that relationship, or you still don't understand what an accountability partner um, I found a free ebook, so it's an electronic version. It's by Covenant Eyes. Right, so, um, anyway, it's called Coming Clean. Right, and Covenant Eyes, like I said, they, they design software for um, specifically for like online help. You know, keeping your keeping your online life clean. Um, but it, it gives us a lot more than that. So things that were in the book, it's about 50 pages long. It's an easy read. I read it last night in like 20 minutes. Um, there's a great examples about what to look for in a good accountability partner. So it'll help you that way. Um, it gives you biblical blocks, uh, like building blocks for accountability, um, how to hold each other accountable in both actions and heart level motivations. Um, gives you reasons why normally accountability typically fails. Because I know a lot of people that have entered accountability relationships and those relationships fail. 
There's some good reasons in there on how they fail and how you can kind of move beyond them. Um, so whether or not a spouse makes a good accountability partner, right? Those choices are in there for you to help guide that. And, um, and there's good discussion, good discussion questions on what you can do if you set up an accountability partner if you choose to regularly meet with them, right? Some things to work through. So I have that resource. If you're interested in it, um, talk to me now, call me, text me, um, and I'll provide you the ebook. Um, if you're interested in it and you don't have access to a digital book, and I understand that most, not most, but some people in Copy don't have that, I'll have to look for either how to purchase the paper print or just print it for you. So um, if you're interested, let me know and, um, and I'll help work it out. So I encourage you to not, you know, go throughout this week and choose to find someone that you can start forming this relationship with. If it's someone within Agape, great. If it's not, still great. Okay? But I do think that we need to start forming these relationships. Um, with that said, we're going to uh, move over into round table. Alan, do you want me to hand it back over to you? Okay. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Say bye.